Hi, I'm Ken Stafford. Uh, this is the second of a series on force analysis that we wanted to cover today. Um, in the first series, we talked about some of the foundations about what forces are and what moments and torques are. Today, we're going to apply them through a technique called free body uh, diagrams, a very useful tool that is um, essential for uh, any kind of um, robotics engineer or mechanical engineer to have in uh, their repertoire. The basic philosophy of free body diagram says that if a robot or a body is in equilibrium, that you can look at any part of that robot or, or that body independently, and if you only look at the external forces around it, it should be in equilibrium as well, which means all the forces and all the moments external to that, to that part you can consider must be equal to zero. To do a free body diagram, uh, there's lots of ways of drawing them. Most of us have had it in physics. Um, the physics solution, by the way, is generally not the best solution for robotics or engineering. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want you to think about only three essential things that have to be in every free body diagram. And anything else you put in there, by the way, may cause some confusion and, and make it less useful for you. The number one thing to have is put all the essential geometry in it. Essential geometry could be distances, could be angles, could be shapes. The second thing then is to look at the borders of that free body diagram and put in every external force and moment that exists. These are the external forces and these will both be known ones, for example, gravity or, or weight, or unknowns, which would be the things you normally happen to solve. And the final and last thing you have to have on here is the coordinate system. This is really a contrivance to make sure that you do your analysis correct and that someone else looking at it can also see what you've done. So armed with those three essential things, let's attack one of the most trivial and simple free body diagrams. It's called a two-force member. Now, a two-force member is very useful to understand. It's, it's used a lot in fundamental analysis in mechanical engineering and, and civil engineering and robotics engineering. Here is an arbitrary shape. It has only two places where there will be forces applied, hence the name two-force member. Now, if you think about this, the only dimension which is of concern is the distance between these two points. So we put these, the distance on here, we have these two points, which are considered to be like pin joints. In other words, they're like a frictionless hinge. If you have a pin joint, you have two potential forces that can happen. Well, you actually have arbitrary directions, but we can break it down to two components, which means we need to apply a coordinate system. Now, as you can see, we can apply these arbitrary forces any way we want to because they're unknown at this time. And, uh, but a convenience of doing this would be to rotate the coordinate system such that the angle between the coordinate system and the two application points on the two-force member becomes zero. This makes the geometry easier. It's not essential, but we'll do it in this case, and you'll find that it's useful probably in general. Before we go much further, though, I've got to tell you something about this analysis of this two-force member. In our example, we're going we're gonna to claim that this two-force member, that material itself, has no mass. This is, makes it much simpler. And by the way, if it did have mass, it would not be a two-force member because that means there's going to be some force distributed between these two endpoints. But it's a very common um, assumption to say that it has no mass. And we're also going to say, by the way, it has, it's perfectly rigid. Now, in my classes, I call this material a special material, and I, I let you use it all the time. It's called Space Age Unobtainium, which has no mass and is perfectly rigid, and by the way, has no friction also. Having these assumptions, though, uh, we can still uh, attack this problem. So, if we've drawn this out properly, we have these arbitrary forces that are at each point. We don't know what direction they are because we're just assuming that they can exist. We apply the equations of equilibrium such as we talked about in the previous section of the video. So, if I look at this and I look at my new tilted coordinate system, I know that the summation of all the forces in the x direction must be equal to zero. In this case, I have drawn, I've drawn these forces in opposite directions just arbitrarily, so I could say that force of x from the A point, and then using, using the conventions that I have here, I would say that negative the force of uh, x at the B point must equal to zero. Therefore, these two forces must be equal to each other. Similarly, if I look at the y direction components, I could say, and again using the sense of these arrows, 
the positive and negative sense of as compared to the coordinate system that I've drawn, I would see that the forces are also must be equal in opposite and sense. So, from a force perspective, I've now satisfied the equations of equilibrium knowing that those must occur and be equal and opposite. In fact, in, I guess in mathematic terms, we could say those, those forces must be un, uh, anti-parallel. However, there is a third equation, and that's a summation of moments. So now, let's arbitrarily uh, look at the moments that are going around uh, point A. Let A be the, the point where to which we resolve our moments, and then look at the forces that, that would cause a torque about that point. First off, you'll notice that none of the forces that I've drawn at point A actually cause a rotation at point A because there is no distance offset. So those will not occur into this equation at all. If we look at point B, we would see that the force along the x direction, which is in lined up now with the two A and B points, also has no distance offset, so therefore uh, does not cause a moment either. However, what about the force of Y at point B? This one does have distance D from point A, therefore in the equation, I would say that the summation of moments in the Z direction about point A, well, must equal zero, and it also equals D times the force of point B in the Y direction. This equation must exist. Well, since D is a finite number, what does that tell you about the force of Y at the B point? It tells you it must equal zero. We have therefore resolved a fundamental understanding of two force members, which says that in a true two force member, the only forces that can exist must be anti-parallel coming through the two points. In other words, they must be equal and opposite and aligned in the same direction. Any other configuration would cause a rotation, which would mean that the body is no longer in static equilibrium. Now, as an aside on two force member, if the two anti-parallel forces are pointed toward each other, we say that that truss is in compression. If they're pointed away from each other, then we call that in tension. Having now considered the rather trivial case of a two-force member, let's look at what that would apply to a real robot. Let's see how we can analyze, by using two-force members, a more complicated truss on an actual robot. Okay, so here we have an actual depiction of a robot. In this robot, we will see that it has a rather massive base, in fact, massive to the point where there is no problem of tipping over no matter how much our load is on the other end of it. But the load is being held up by a five two-force member truss. And we would like to analyze that truss to see what the compressive or tension loads are in each of those truss members. It may not be clear which ones are in compression or tension without just by looking at it. So we'll actually have to go through a much more detailed analysis using free body diagrams at each of the points. So to start with, let's first off look at the overall geometry of the uh, robot truss itself. Uh, we will label each of these points uh, as shown, and then also establish some of the basic geometry which is uh, given in the problem. Now at this point, we could look at this problem and recognize some familiar numbers. Uh, from geometry, we recognize that the uh, ABC triangle is a 30-60-90 triangle, and that the ACD triangle is a 45-45 isosceles triangle. This is of interest to us when we start uh, developing our actual free body diagrams to do the further analysis. Now that we've uh, looked at the overall robot, we need to look at just one part at a time, however. If we look at each of the points individually, we would notice at point A, for example, that there are actually three unknown forces that could exist there. Uh, similarly, if we look at point C, there actually would be a normal force from the basic robot chassis plus three trusses coming in there, which means that there could be four unknowns on that point. And at point D, there are two unknown forces along the two force members, but then there is also a solid attachment point to the chassis, which has both an X and Y components that could be existing there. So it actually has four unknowns as well. Finally, let's look at B. B only has two two force members attached to it, which means there are two unknown forces there and unknown force weight. Voila! With only two unknown forces, this is the easiest one and the one we should attack initially. Now let's look at the essential geometry of point B. The only geometry we need to know is the direction of the forces. So we know there are two unknown forces acting on it from the two force members. And through that two force member analysis, we know that the forces must be aligned between these two points. 
So I will arbitrarily draw them coming away from point B uh, along the, the uh, axis of their trusses. I also know there is a known force which is acting downward. That's the weight, which is 100 newtons in this case. Now we've got the central geometry. We have all the forces, known and unknown, and we simply need to put in the coordinate system. Because it's conveniently aligned, let's use a normal Cartesian coordinate system of X and Y. Having all the information on the free body diagram, our task is now simply to convert this into a set of equations of equilibrium. I suggest we start with the one we know the most about, which would be the summation of forces in the Y direction. It must, of course, equal zero. In this case, it's going to be the negative 100 newtons from the weight. Plus, of course, as you can see, it would be the Y component of the unknown force BC. In this case, it's also in the negative direction, so the total equation is as shown. So now proceeding with the rather trivial algebra, we look at the summation of forces in the Y equation, and we find that the, uh, by rearranging the factors here, that the force of BC would equal the minus 100 divided by the sine of 30, which means it equals minus 200 newtons. Now, by the way, at this point, I will say that the negative sign doesn't mean you're wrong. It simply means that the arrow is in the, as displayed on our free body diagram, was in the opposite direction. To me, because of my convention, the negative also means that that member is in compression. Similarly, we can now proceed on to the summation of forces in the x direction. In this case, you'll see that it would be the full negative force BA plus the x component of this unknown force BC, which in this case would be the negative cosine of force BC. Don't be concerned, by the way, that both these force equations have negative numbers on them because the mathematics and the arithmetic will uh, resolve the problem for you as you proceed along. Also note that we have two unknowns, so we have two equations. And since it is only a point which has no distance offset from any of the forces, there can be no moments about this point, which means we only actually have two equations of equilibrium to solve this problem. Now, proceeding on to the summation of forces in the x direction, we see that, that uh, we rearrange the factors there. We find that the force, unknown force BA equals negative cosine of 30 times the negative 200 that we just uh, arrived at in our earlier equation, which means now then this comes out that F of BA then must equal a positive 173 newtons. And again, through my conventions, a positive result on the equation of equilibrium denotes tension. By the way, this is the convenience of always drawing your unknown forces away from a pin joint, is that when it becomes positive in your equations of equilibrium, then you've drawn it in the correct direction, meaning tension. And if it becomes negative, that means you've drawn it arbitrarily in the wrong direction, which means it's under compression. So now I leave it to the viewer of this video to go ahead and resolve the entire system of forces in this truss. At the end of the day, you should have a solution that looks like this.